You are listening to Gone But Never Forgotten. Our topics can include, but are not limited to, murder, sexual assault, graphic and gruesome details, and more. These topics are adult in nature and are not meant for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. Imagine having a night out on the town that included having a blast at a local nightclub and visiting two house parties. That sounds like a great night to many people. Unfortunately, for one young 21-year-old indigenous woman, that kind of night would wind up being the last known night in her young life. She would leave her parents' home around 11 p.m. in Nanaimo, B.C., and she would sadly never be seen by them again. Even though she has not been seen or heard from since that harrowing night, and even though police have never found a body, her disappearance is being treated as, and investigated as, murder. Hello, and welcome to episode 35 of Gone But Never Forgotten, The Disappearance of Lisa Marie Young. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to GBNF. Let me start off here by saying that we hoped you enjoyed the new intro track for the show that you heard just now. One of our best friends was kind enough to put that together for us. A wholehearted thank you goes out to Brian for his hard work and his kindness in doing that for us. Brian is an incredible musician who shows his creativity and originality in all that he does. His latest album, An Ordinary Guy, is available on Bandcamp, and from now on, we will always add his social media links in our show notes. Check out Gallagher on Spotify and Apple Music, or go to his Bandcamp at gallagherofficial.bandcamp.com. Thanks, Brian. We love you. We, of course, also want to tell you all that we appreciate each and every one of you listening. Every week that we look at the numbers for the podcast, we are blown away that you all take the time to come back and listen to our voices on another episode. That is equal parts flattering, baffling, and amazing. Lance is underselling how much he likes to look at the numbers. He is telling me every day how many listeners we have had and what's going on. So yes, thank you so much for spending some of your valuable time with us each and every week. We have so many cool things coming through the pipeline for the podcast, but we always like to remind you how you can be a part of our team. The best way, of course, is by signing up on Patreon and getting so many cool things from us. We send our patrons stickers, we shout you out on the podcast, and of course, you do get the benefit of getting your hands on new episodes early and ad-free if you're a patron. Which, as an avid listener to podcasts myself, I can tell you that that is valuable in and of itself. You can always check us out over on Patreon to see the tiers that we have to offer for our fans. But the best part is that it is cheap, and you can help us to make these episodes bigger and better by signing up. I actually had a really cool experience at a baseball game here recently. I wore my GBNF hoodie to the baseball game, and a lady asked me about the podcast that was on the hoodie. She didn't know right away that I was involved with it at all. We certainly don't have that celebrity status yet. But I told the lady that we cover true crime stories and what we do and about the podcast, and hopefully she's out there listening to us now. Please remember, too, that we honestly love to interact with you guys on social media. You can find us anywhere, and let's chat. Let's talk true crime. Let's talk cases we have covered and cases we haven't. And don't hesitate to tell us if we make mistakes or miss something on a particular case. Julie will tell you that I'm not the best at taking criticism, even of the constructive kind, but I will do my best. 
We're just two average schmucks out here trying to share true crime stories with all of you. I'm certainly not a pro's pro at any of this. We're just trying to help. So with all of that out of the way, let's jump into this episode and cover the sad disappearance of Lisa Marie Young. Lisa Marie Young was one of three children born to Don Young and Marlene Martin, better known as Joanne. She had two younger brothers named Brian and Robin, and she grew up in Nanaimo, British Columbia. Joanne was native in heritage. Her maternal grandfather, Moses Martin, is the tribal chief of the Tlaoquiot First Nation, which is located on Vancouver Island on the western coast. Both of Lisa Marie's parents were native and attended Kakawis Residential School on Mears Island. Lisa Marie's upbringing was different than the residential school connections that we have spoken about in the past. She was very close with her family, and she had a good upbringing in Nanaimo. She attended Brecon Elementary School and Woodlands Secondary School in Nanaimo. Joanne describes her daughter as an incredibly independent woman who worked hard and was very stubborn. She says that her daughter's inner strength was her best attribute and her driving force. There was nothing that Lisa would decide to do that could be stopped. When her mind was set, she was set to completion. In that vein of being a hard worker, Lisa had worked as a bartender, and right after her disappearance, she was set to start a new job working at a call center. And her father also was helping her to slowly move into a new place in Nanaimo, something that she was incredibly excited for. Lisa's dream was to pursue a post-secondary education so that she could become a sports broadcaster on TV. On the night of June 29th, Lisa had plans to head out on the town with several of her friends in Nanaimo. Before she headed out, at 11 p.m., would be the last time that her family would see her. They remember being surprised that she was going out with friends because she had a very busy week ahead, what with the new job and the move in progress. But she was insistent that she must go out because it was a night out to celebrate one of her best friends, Dallas Hully. The night began at a club in downtown Nanaimo called the Jungle Cabaret. The club is now known as Evolve Nightclub. The friends all had a great time at the club and stayed until it closed at 2.30 a.m. While they were at the club, Lisa and her friends would meet a man named Christopher William Adair who would invite them out to a house party in the south end of the city. After discussing the plan, Lisa and her friends agreed to take a ride with Christopher, and they went to two different house parties. At the second house party, Lisa started to get very hungry. It wasn't as simple as grabbing something to eat at the party for Lisa, though, because she was a vegetarian. Christopher seemingly came to her rescue and told her that he knew of a restaurant that was close by, and was still open at the late hour, and would have food that she would be able to eat. Lisa, at this point driven by her hunger, agreed to go with Christopher. They left the party around 4 a.m., and that would end up being the last time that she was seen. She was seen leaving that house party in Christopher's Jaguar. It didn't take long, though, for Lisa to realize that things had gone awry. She called her friend Dallas at 4.30 a.m. to let him know that she wasn't sure what was going on. Christopher had taken her to another house party instead of taking her to a restaurant as he had said and as they had planned. She told Dallas she was sitting in Christopher's car because she did not feel comfortable at the party. She didn't know any of the people at the party and she wasn't even sure where she was anymore. Lisa's cell phone signal was tracked to the Departure Bay area of Nanaimo as a part of the investigation. But as stated, even though Lisa was asking for help, nobody knew where she was at this point. The final contact that anyone would have with Lisa came in the form of a text message from Lisa, again to Dallas. The text message said, quote, Come get me. They won't let me leave. Unquote. Dallas would later tell investigators in an interview that he picked up that call from Lisa, and sure enough, it was Lisa on the phone. He said that she told him, quote, I don't know what's going on. 
This guy won't bring me back. We're sitting in a driveway on Bowen Road and he won't bring me back. I'm bored. I'm getting pissed off. Unquote. That, of course, was the wee hours of June 30th. On July 1st, 2002, when Lisa's family had not heard from her still, they started to get really worried. However, knowing that she was a very busy woman, they believed that perhaps she was just too busy to answer her phone. Things changed, however, when Lisa's former roommate came to her parents' house to ask if they had seen or heard from Lisa. That made her family spring into action quickly as they realized that seemingly nobody had been with Lisa or heard from her. Her family started calling everyone that was in Lisa's phone book, and then when they came up empty, they got in touch with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in Nanaimo to report her as missing. This is where we see something that has become common in our cases that we've covered regarding missing Native women. The RCMP first told the family to call them back after she had been missing for 48 hours. Again, I'm going to mention as an aside, we covered in a previous case, there is a myth in Canada that you cannot report someone as missing until they've been missing for 48 hours when it's an adult. That's not true. It would appear that there was a change in heart somewhere along the way, though, the RCMP actually sent an officer to the young home later that evening to start a report and to ask the family questions and to get a picture of Lisa. Over the next couple days, though, there was not a lot of contact with the Nanaimo RCMP as the initial officer that came to the house was out of the office for a few days and the family was simply told to call back when he returned to the office. After a couple of days, the family managed to get the case moved to another officer who was at work, but still, not a lot was going on. After about a week and a half, police suddenly went from a level of seeming disinterest in the case to announcing that it was being investigated by their serious crimes unit. It certainly is strange to me that police seemingly immediately moved their investigation towards being a serious crime. But, as always, we certainly don't know what the police had heard, seen, or uncovered at that, part, at that point as a part of their investigation. So I will give the benefit of the doubt here, and we will cover this timeline a little later in the episode. And what about Christopher, the man that she was known to have been with? That seems like a logical question here. Someone must have known him, or at least been able to tell police what the car looked like, or maybe even get them a license plate number. Yeah, it would be much later in the month of July that police would first question Christopher. Let me tell you, that is a weird part. How so? Well, first of all, Christopher was known to police to say the least. Christopher had previously been charged with assault, fraud, and theft in Kamloops, British Columbia. And he had also been previously charged with unauthorized use of credit cards in Edmonton, Alberta. Wow. So this guy got around and certainly didn't seem to be the best kind of person. Yep, that's an understatement. After Lisa disappeared, Christopher was also charged in Yorkton, Saskatchewan for assaulting a police officer. So that's three provinces with charges against him in what sounds like a pretty short amount of time. Certainly. I wonder if that's part of why it's so difficult for police to connect with him at that point. Christopher seemed to know how to get around, and he also seemed to know how to get himself into trouble that was against the law. Certainly not an upstanding citizen, that's for sure. So, what happened when Christopher was finally interviewed? Well, prepare yourself. So, Joanne, Lisa's mom was called to meet with Christopher at an RCMP detachment. The two spoke in a very small room that had an oversized photo of Lisa inside of it and the words accident, murder, and rape written on the whiteboard that was also in the room. In that meeting, it's reported that Christopher told Joanne that he had dropped Lisa off somewhere and that she had planned to call a taxi. This obviously goes against the evidence that we are aware of, up to and including the text messages from Lisa stating that she needed help and that Christopher and others would not let her go. Joanne pressed Christopher more and outright asked him if he was able to tell her where her daughter was. Christopher reportedly responded by telling her, 
quote, I can't. I'm sorry. I don't mean to disrespect your family, unquote. The Jaguar that Christopher was driving that night belonged to Christopher's grandmother, Geraldine Adair. Not too terribly long after Lisa's disappearance, she sold the car and then went on to threaten to sue and go after anyone that tried to imply that Christopher was involved with whatever happened to Lisa. That seems highly suspicious. It does, but to play devil's advocate also, if police and every Tom, Dick, and Harry were coming by to sneak a peek at the car, wouldn't you sell it also? It seems like it would become a massive pain in the butt to keep the car. Of course, I'm not saying that it isn't entirely possible, though, that the car was sold to get rid of evidence. I mean, I thought at least there was hope here because they had Christopher in their custody at least. But even that was not the case. After he was interviewed and had that meeting with Joanne, Christopher would be let go with no charges laid. The police would tell the public, quote, the driver, like many others involved in this file, is simply a person of interest, unquote. A while after all of this, police did locate the Jaguar and it was brought in for investigation. I could not find too much information about what they did or did not find. I'm starting to see what you always talk about with the discrepancies between how different cases are handled. The sad part is that for all intents and purposes, this is where the information on what police were doing kind of dries up. The police have been widely criticized in this case, and you can look at the circumstantial evidence and put together all kinds of theories. But it looks like Joanne gives a photograph to an officer of her daughter, and immediately the police went into a wait-and-see pattern. They saw a beautiful, young, aboriginal girl, and they simply seem to have hit the brakes on any kind of rush on this case. Joanne has admitted that she tried to hide the fact on her initial call to police that Lisa was Aboriginal because she was afraid that the missing person call would be treated differently. It isn't like this wasn't something that her family was even entirely shocked about, which is even more heart-wrenching. I keep saying that I want to cover the Highway of Tears, but it's such an undertaking, and to be honest, a lot of the research will also be a learning experience for me. But yes, people in Canada, especially in British Columbia, were not new to the perception that the police took different cases more seriously than others. I'll leave it at that. I'm already known as the guy who seems to knock the police a bunch, I know that. I should say here that I do totally respect the police, and I have so much respect for the good police that work their asses off for all of us. I genuinely do. But I do also believe that I'm a person who calls a spade a spade, though, and I will always point and call bullshit when I think there is some. On July 6, it was reported that the police believed that there wasn't any evidence yet available to them to indicate that foul play was involved in Lisa's disappearance. That alone is crazy to me. I mean, by this point, they had to have seen text messages and spoken to Dallas to find out that Lisa had at least expressed some level of distress here. So to believe that there was no evidence or even chance of foul play, it's nuts. On July 9th, though, the reports had changed to expressing that there were five officers from the Serious Crimes Unit working on the case. Okay, so a week after Lisa went missing, something seems to change. On July 10th, it was announced that the Nanaimo RCMP now believed that Lisa had met with foul play. I would lay out a bit here and let you finish, but unfortunately that's it. Foul play. No mention of how, or why, or suspects, or sports cars, just, yep, we think she was murdered. Things got worse. Even though this was now being investigated as a murder case, there was absolutely no great rush to mobilize. Like you said earlier, the optics here were awful. Because there was so much anger towards the police about their lack of search effort, Lisa's grandfather, the chief of the Tlaoqui out organized a tribal search and rescue team. They were organized into quite a few large efforts around Nanaimo and other nearby places. The searches took place between July of 2002 and into 2003 by the tribal search party. The police, for their part, did a search, eventually. 
The first search was scheduled to take place on September 3rd, after a tip came in to them in August. That sounds pretty bad, right? It took them at least a couple of weeks to put something together. That search didn't happen, though. The first ground search took place for three hours on September 18th. Almost three months after Lisa had gone missing, and almost two months after investigators announced that they believed that there was foul play involved in this case. And that's really the end of the details, sadly. What's crazy to me is that Lisa's family was has still not ever been told by investigators what Christopher's explanation truly was of the night in question. They have never been told if he had an alibi. They have never been told what he said or did that proved to them that he was just a POI and not a suspect. Every year, Lisa's friends, family, and the public get together on or around June 30th for a walk for Lisa to make sure that nobody forgets that there is still a story seeking an end here. You have to keep the name and the story in the public eye. Joanne, Lisa's mom, sadly passed away on June 21st, 2017, after she had a plethora of health problems, much of which was certainly believed to have been caused by and exacerbated by the disappearance of her daughter. She had been taking dialysis, she suffered from hypertension, and she was awaiting a kidney transplant at the time of her death. That's absolutely heartbreaking. Nobody should have to go through all of this, never mind the fact that even while she was sick, she did so much work advocating and trying to find out what had happened to her daughter. This woman was a fighter and sadly passed away without having any closure or explanation. I cannot imagine. Dallas Hulley, the friend of Lisa whose birthday it was when she went missing, also passed away tragically on March 25th of 2018. He was struck and killed by a car while walking along Highway 19A. A friend of Lisa was Alison Crow, who is a Canadian singer-songwriter. Her recording debut came in 2003 when she released Lisa's Song Plus Six Songs, an EP. Lisa's Song was a song that she composed in memory of Lisa. It is a beautiful song and we will link to it in the show notes. There has been a massive push on Lisa's case of late, which is amazing to see. Now coming up on the 20th anniversary of her disappearance. In March of 2021, the mayor of Nanaimo declared June 26th as Lisa Marie Young Day and June 30th as Lights On for Lisa. People were encouraged to take part in Lights for Lisa Day by leaving porch lights on to recognize the disappearance and unsolved case. There are rewards for helping with this case. Since 2004, the Tlaoqui Out First Nation Band has been offering $11,500 for information leading to the location of Lisa Marie Young. And there has been a recent update. In February of 2022, an anonymous donor from the United States offered a $50,000 U.S. dollar reward for information that leads investigators to the location of Lisa's remains. It is, of course, believed that if investigators can locate the remains of Lisa, then that may provide them with the evidence that they require to pursue charges as well. We can only hope that this latest development of offering more reward money will motivate someone, somewhere, to come forward with information. These changes came because police in 2021 did say that they had more information coming in regarding Lisa, so one can only hope that more reward money will make someone seriously come forward if they do know where Lisa is. A post from the Lisa Marie Young group, posted by advocate Cindy Hall in January of this year, says what we read in numerous places, so we will report it here. It is believed that Christopher Adair is in Turkey now, living an entirely new life and still not talking about Lisa or that night, it seems. Whether he's running from his past or he has moved on with his life, what bothers me is that he's not talking to anyone about this. Honestly, say your piece. If you weren't involved, speak up. Share whatever alibi you either have or have cooked up over the years. If you were involved, have some damn compassion for this family and tell them what happened to Lisa and where they can find her body. 
Enough is enough after 20 years. This is frustrating, and honestly, if he was involved, as everyone seems to believe, this is very sadistic on his part. We covered what happened to everyone else in the case, and we hope that in the near future, we will be able to do an update episode on this case. One where we cover a sad story, if need be, but one that brings closure to the family and friends after all these years. It sounds weird to tell a murderer to have compassion after all these years, but whoever you are and wherever you are, tell this family what happened to their beloved Lisa. Lisa Marie Young was last seen on June 30th, 2002 in Nanaimo, BC. She was last seen leaving a house party in a red Jaguar with Christopher William Adair. At the time of her disappearance, she was 21 years old. She is an indigenous woman who was 5 foot 4 and 115 pounds at the time of her disappearance. She had brown eyes and brown hair. On her right arm, she had a tattoo of a band of flowers with a heart in the middle. At the, same, at the time that she was last seen, she was wearing a black shirt, a black skirt, and black boots. And she was wearing a silver hooped necklace. If you have any information on Lisa Marie Young, please call Corporal Muntner of the Nanaimo RCMP at 250-754-2345. There is info in the news. This is being covered again 20 years later. If you know anything, please call and give the information to the RCMP. Let's do Lisa the dignity of telling the rest of her story so that those responsible can be brought to justice and her family can have the closure that they rightly deserve. Is there anything else you want to add on this case, Julie? I don't think there's anything I want to add. I just hate like reading or doing research or hearing about stories that are almost, I don't know if they're racially like started or done racially, but they're not handled correctly because of race, like anything around race or culture or anything like that. It just really turns my stomach because like that has nothing to do with anything. It's just a person like everybody else, you know? So I just, it really just makes me super, super sad that things get handled differently for different groups of people. I agree. Can I get on my soapbox now? Go ahead. All right, time for my soliloquy. Here we go. I just want to say that I wish everything and everyone could be better. Yes, of course, the world would be a better place if we didn't have death and murder and horrible criminals. But maybe we can start out with something that should, in theory, be easier to attain. Although certainly near impossible in its own right. I wish that we could get rid of racism. Of course, I wish that we could get rid of it everywhere, but let's start smaller. Can we please have a legal system, police forces, and governments that do not operate with a level of racism whatsoever? I mean, at times throughout history, there have been such blatant examples of it, and I believe that this case is one of those cases. I wish that I could say it was a different time, but 20 years ago isn't that long ago. And this certainly still happens today. Hopefully not as much, and certainly not always as blatantly, but I do think that all of us know that it still happens. I just wish that we lived in a world where people would not, were not prioritized based on how much money they have, or where they came from, or what they do for a living, but especially not because of the color of their skin. Why don't we treat all people as people, like Julie just said. This starts with every person, us, me and Julie included. Just be a better person today than you were yesterday. Does it actually hurt at all to be inclusive? Does it actually cause any damage to be inclusive of all other people? Of everyone around you? We're all here in this damn thing together. We're working together, we're living together, we're struggling together, and sometimes we're all just trying to exist together, but we're all human beings. Maybe we would do well to just treat one another as such in every single area. I'm not asking a lot. Let's just all be better. Okay, that's a shirt, so we should make a shirt. But apart from that, I want to say I completely agree with you and exactly what you said. So actually, you going on your soapbox, I am totally for it today. Oh, that's a miracle. 
Usually you don't want to hear what I got to well, say. Well, today I agree. <laughs> All right. Well, I think I'm off the soapbox. I think that's the end of my rant for this week. So thank you for stopping me there. Thank you all for listening to Gone But Never Forgotten. We'll see you next week. And remember, be better.